our topic for today is the evolution of the human rights movement from the Holocaust until the 20th century. And what we <coughs> will see during the course of the morning and subsequently during our discussion this afternoon, uh, to which I'm looking forward very, very much, is the unfolding of an intense international human drama, a drama in which the individual takes center stage or close to center stage on the international plane from a position previously where the international, where the individual was no more than a mere appendage to his or her state of no consequence in and of themselves to a position where the individual today is very much an international legal person with rights, with obligations, and with the ability to enforce rights and obligations directly in international law, in international tribunals and other fora, including as against the individual's own state. That is a remarkable transformation. It is not overstating things to say that it is a veritable revolution. And as we will see, it's a revolution that has been termed subversive. And we'll see in what sense it's been termed subversive. Human rights is in fact a very new phenomenon. Today we take certain things for granted. We take for granted, for instance, that there is a network of treaties, conventions, and a plethora of other instruments of international law conferring human rights on individuals. We take it for granted that there are bodies all over the place monitoring human rights, overseeing their implementation, working to enforce them, whether they are organs of the United Nations or non-governmental organizations. We open the papers almost daily and see reports about investigations, reports by organizations such as Human Rights Watch, Amnesty International, and so on. And we've come to take this sort of thing for granted terms such as crimes against humanity, genocide, war crimes, roll off the tongue quite effortlessly today. The spectacle of a Slobodan Milosevic standing trial for massive war crimes is not thought of today as anything so particularly revolutionary to the extent that the media have become quite blasé about it. There was a flurry of publicity in the initial days, uh, but when was the last time there was an item in the <laughs> New York Times, say, about the crime of Slobodan Milosevic? We see the spectacle of other leaders in the former Yugoslavia and in other places like Rwanda in the dock. And we take these sorts of things fairly for granted as being rather unremarkable. We live in an era where there are plenty of tribunals for prosecuting major violations of human rights. The major one, of course, being the one for the former Yugoslavia, the tribunal for Rwanda. Newer ones cropping up. Sierra Leone is an expert on that tribunal sitting uh, here today with us, and I look forward to hearing comments from him later on. Cambodia, another interesting case where interesting discussions are being taken place about bringing the leaders of the Khmer Rouge to justice for their human rights atrocities of 25 or so years ago. We think in terms of an international court of, uh, criminal court, a permanent international criminal court designed to investigate, prosecute, bring to justice leaders of countries and those lower down in the hierarchy who have committed major human rights violations. We think 
in terms of boundaries, across temporal boundaries. So that today, for instance, we can think in terms of a magistrate judge sitting in Spain issuing an extradition request for a former leader of the Chilean government who happens to be in London getting medical treatment to go and stand trial in Spain for crimes committed against his own people in Chile some 25 years earlier. And if not for the fact that he had medical evidence that he was unwell and unfit to, to be extradited to stand trial, he would today be standing trial in Spain. Crossing temporal boundaries. There is no statute of limitations in international law. And so we find even today, in 2003, prosecutions taking place for Holocaust era atrocities. A few years ago, in the mid-1990s, there were trials in Hungary arising out of the Hungarian Revolution some 40 years earlier. There's talk about bringing to trial the Khmer Rouge, as I've indicated, leaders of the Khmer Rouge for atrocities committed over 25 years ago. Chile, Argentina, people are being brought to justice without regard to statutes of limitations. There is no such concept in international law. So most of this is fairly pedestrian these days. We take it for granted. It's part of the normalcy in which we live today. So much so that it's easy to forget, all too easy to forget, two things. First of all, how recent a phenomenon it all is. A mere 60 years ago, which in international legal terms is the blink of an eyelid, none of this existed. None of this could really have been dreamed of. Secondly, we tend to forget what a massive revolution has been wrought by the international human rights movement, both in international law as well as in international relations generally, to the extent, as I've indicated, that it's all being called subversive, and we'll see in what sense. So our aim today really is to understand the nature of that revolution, what has in fact happened, why has it happened, and why is it truly revolutionary? My approach really will be to start from the middle, so to speak, and then, well, I'm in Australia, so I, everything's upside down for me anyway. And we'll work back from the middle, back into history, to develop a contrast, uh, to develop an appreciation for the need for a system of human rights, and in order to help us understand the ultimate depths to which a society can sink, to which the society can sink. And then we'll move forward and see how this revolution has taken hold and how it's developed in the 55 years since the centerpiece of our discussion, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. In the materials, we find that <coughs> Universal Declaration towards the end of the materials on page V290. V stands for part five, meaning that it's part five of my own teaching materials. In my course, more in the whole course. If you think you've had too much reading for this week, um, consider yourselves fortunate. This is the set of teaching material. Even my students don't have to get through all of it. There are two features in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights <coughs> in which I want to draw particular attention. We're talking about a document that is really the constitution or the charter of the international human rights movement. It's the fulcrum around which everything else revolves. And as we can see at the top of page 290, it was adopted by the General Assembly of the United Nations sitting in Paris on 
December the 10th, 1948, presided over, I might add, by the President of the General Assembly, Dr. Herbert Ebert from Australia. That has no relevance to anything I'm saying, but uh, I have to get in a plug for Australia. The two salient features begin with the opening words of the preamble, whereas recognition of the inherent dignity and of the equal and inalienable rights of all members of the human family, etc. Inherent dignity, equal and inalienable rights. That proclaims that each person has inherent dignity and worth simply and solely by virtue of being born a human being irrespective of any other consideration. We will see the phenomenal import of those few words. The second salient feature begins on the next page. And we see there, apart from Articles 1 and 2, which are of a general nature, a long list of rights which are recognized by this document as being human rights, beginning first and foremost with Article 3, which talks about the right to live, the right to be allowed to live, meaning not to have one's life uh, arbitrarily taken. Article 4 prohibiting slavery or servitude. Article 5, prohibiting torture or cruel, inhuman or degrading treatment. And so on. So there we have a detailed list going through to articles in well into the 20s of rights which this document recognizes as being human rights. Both of these two features of that document are important for our purposes this morning. Specifically, they were a reaction, both of those features. They were a reaction to a specific event or era in history, which was very fresh at that time, 1948, but which represented the ultimate antithesis or denial of both aspects of that document to which I've drawn attention. And I'm talking about the Holocaust. The term Holocaust, according to the Oxford English Dictionary, can be traced back over 750 <coughs> years, connoting the sense of a massive conflagration after the war, it was capitalized, capital H, to denote the attempt to exterminate all the Jews of Europe, numbering some 11 million, a little over 11 million in fact, um, with the Nazis succeeding tragically to the extent of around 6 million. During the course of the Nazi wars, although for the victims and eternity, whilst the primary focus of the Nazis was on the Jews, with the attempt to exterminate all of them, with a conference being held on January the 20th, 1942 at Ranseille, a suburb of Berlin, at which the logistics of that planned extermination were discussed, and a document was presented in bland accounting fashion, country by country, totaling the number of Jews in each country, with the total at the end in excess of 11 million. And that was the aim, to exterminate all of them. In addition, of course, millions of other people, by categories, gypsies, homosexuals, Poles, Russians, and so on, 
were at the subject of this massive, massive assault by the Nazi regime. The focus of my own work, in particular, is on the legal dimension to the Holocaust, which on the surface seems like a contradiction in terms, a massive oxymoron. The Nazi regime perpetrated the ultimate lawlessness, and yet, with bitter irony, we see a fanatical obsession to legalize the rising level of intolerance, particularly against the Jews, and the le rising level of atrocities to the extent that vis-a-vis -vis the Jews themselves, something of the order of 2,000 laws, 2,000 laws were passed, directed solely and specifically and directly against the Jews in that 12-year period. The statistic becomes even more remarkable when one considers that when the Nazis came to power in 1933, Jews comprised a little under 1% of the population of Germany. And during the course of 1930s, by virtue of attrition, natural attrition, and immigration, that fell to under one half of 1% 1 in 1939. And yet there was this massive torrent of legislation directed against the Jews. And the obsession is illustrated by an extraordinary exchange, a bizarre exchange, that took place on November the 12th, 1938, just after a massive rampage known as Kristallnacht, the night of the broken glass, uh, when Jewish properties, in particular synagogues and other communal institutions, were assaulted on a massive scale and a whole lot of destruction and havoc was wreaked. Two days later, after this event which took place on the night of the 9th and 10th of November 1938, Hermann Goering convened a conference to discuss the implications of Kristallnacht and the aftermath of Kristallnacht and the plan for the future. Goebbels, the propaganda minister, Hitler's government was there, and during the course of the discussion, Goering said, if a good German gets onto a bus and it's crowded and there's a Jew there, the German has the right to throw the Jew off the bus, to which Goebbels responded, no, no, I don't agree with that, there must be a law. In other words, if there is a law, then it is perfectly acceptable, if there is no law, then it is not acceptable. And it makes you wonder what was going through his mind. What was it about a law that converted something that was inherently improper into something that was acceptable? The question beca uh, comes into sharper focus when one considers what a law was. We think in terms of law as being something passed by Congress. You have regular elections, People are elected to a parliament, to a congress, they convene in the capital city, in the legislation is introduced, it's debated, it's discussed, it's amended, it's eventually passed. That to us is a law. In Nazi Germany, nothing of the sort was the case. In the 12 years between 1933 and 1945, the Reichstag, the German parliament, passed the Nuremberg Laws of 1935, which we'll talk about shortly. Laws in Nazi Germany were really executive orders, administrative decrees. So someone would sit down and throw together a few lines or a few paragraphs. Often the laws were no more than, no longer than that. Sometimes they were longer. Uh, and then one or more ministers in Hitler's government, possibly including Hitler himself, would sign it, and that was a law. So. What Goebbels was saying was, if I and some of my cohorts sign a bit of paper, then it is okay to throw a Jew off a bus, but if I don't, if we don't, then it's not. It's a fascinating question, and perhaps we'll 
I spent a few moments looking at, at the answer to that question. Why was he so obsessed with legalizing things? What I've done in my own work is to isolate a number of themes in the legislative assault on the Jews, which was part of the greater assault on the Jews, the wider assault. Um, and what I want to do is go through a number of these themes because it's important in laying foundations for what we're going to talk about and what our theme is this morning. Because in the course of these themes, we see excellent examples of how the indicia of humanity of the Jews was gradually whittled away, step by step, incrementally. And we will see how international law in the post-war era reacted to this whittling away on a measure-for-measure -measure basis. So that my foreshadowing where we're heading, one can look down that list of human rights in the Universal Declaration, and one can literally check off one theme after another in the legislation enacted, quote unquote, by the Nazi regime. And so the international human rights movement, as we will see, reacted on a measure for measure basis. But we will also see the relevance of the first extract from the Universal Declaration to which I've already drawn attention. But before looking at some of the themes in the legislation, let's lay the ideological foundations for what took place. The point is that the legislation didn't spring up out of thin air. Like all legislation, it was the application or the implementation of an underlying philosophy and in that sense, the Nazi party was no different than any other political party. And it's a very useful way of looking at it, I think, to think in terms of the Nazi party as a political party, which it was. And of course, the aim of any political party is to organize itself, to field candidates for office, to have those candidates elected, and preferably to have them elected in numbers sufficient to form a government. And then, once it's in power, to implement its underlying philosophy, usually expressed in a party political platform, among other things, by enacting legislation to give it all effect. And so one can put oneself, conceptually anyway, in the shoes of the legal counsel to the Nazi party the day after Hitler comes to power. In January 1933, he becomes chancellor. Um, he now has to prepare a legislative program. So what does he do? He reaches up onto the shelf, opens Hitler's Mein Kampf, and starts working out what laws are necessary to give effect to the philosophy that is expressed there. So that there is a sort of sick, perverse logic about it all when one thinks about it in those terms. At the heart of the Nazi legal, uh, Nazi philosophy, which was translated into the legal system, were a number of propositions. First of all, that all of humankind is divided into different racial groups in hierarchical formation, with the Aryans at the top, the Jews at the bottom, and others in between. Secondly, all of history is a struggle by the higher races, by the better, purer blood types, to prevent infiltration and pollution by the lower blood types, lower racial groups. Within all of that, Jews were seen, on the one hand, as vermin as a form of pestilence, the worst polluters of the Aryan blood. And it's all there in so many <coughs> words in Hitler's Mein Kampf and expressed more mystically, in more quasi-mystical terms by Alfred Rosenberg in his book, The Myth of the 20th Century. <coughs> 
paradoxically and at the same time, Jews were also seen as a mortal threat or danger to the very fabric of society. People have painted them as people who come into a society as strangers, insinuate themselves into that society, blend into that society, and gradually take over the uh, principal points of power in the society, and eventually take over and uh, implement, whether it's Bolshevism uh, or some other insidious form of um, political philosophy that will ultimately uh, damage the society immensely. That's simplifying it and perhaps oversimplifying it, but uh, in broad terms that's what Hitler was talking about. And there is uh, a, an inherent paradox or potential paradox between the two views of the Jews which he espouses. But if you see society in those terms, if you see all of history in those terms, then it makes sense in a sick, perverted way to separate out certain racial groups, to isolate them, to remove them from society, to remove their influence from society. And one way of doing that is through legislation as part of, of an overall concerted strategy. Again, there is a sick, perverse logic to it all. But the underlying point at the very heart of all of this, and this is critical for our purposes, is that in, on that view, human beings are not equal. Human beings do not have inter inherent dignity and worth. One has dignity and worth by reference to the racial group into which one belongs. And on that view, the ultimate corollary is that there is no such thing as human rights. Because the very notion of human rights implies that one has rights simply and solely by virtue of being born a human being. One has inherent dignity and worth simply and solely by being born a human being, irrespective of the color of the skin or the slant of the eyes or the day on which one worships or doesn't worship, wholly relevant. That is at the notion of human rights. One has rights simply and solely by being uh, born a human. With that in mind, let's isolate a number of things in the legislation, and these are really, as I've indicated, ref reflective of a wider assault on the Jews. I do it per medium of the legislation uh, simply because that happens to be the focus of my own interest as a lawyer, um, teaching a course on this subject uh, a little bit further down the street at the law school. Theme number one, the theme of definition. That was quite critical to the legislative scheme of things because it was the fulcrum around which all the other legislation revolved. If one is going to attack the Jews and rid society of them and their influence, then the starting point logically is to know who is a Jew, who is, a, who is the target. Initially, the hypothesis was that one could isolate a Jewish blood type. And a lot of pseudo-scientific research went on in the early days of the regime, trying to isolate the Jewish <coughs> blood type, because that would have made it very, very easy to determine who qualified as a Jew and was therefore <coughs> the subject of everything else that was heaped on uh, people known as Jews. That pseudo-scientific research ended as it was bound to in ignominious failure, but uh, nevertheless a lot of that pseudo-scientific research went on. Ultimately, in September 1935, the infamous Nuremberg Laws were passed, and what's particularly important is not so much the Nuremberg Laws themselves, um, which dealt uh, in a fundamental way with the question of race, and we'll come to that in a moment, but what's more important for the purposes of this theme is actually the first ordinance to the Nuremberg Laws, which was 
promulgated on the 14th of November 1935. And that enshrined the basic definition of a Jew. A person was a Jew if he or she had three Jewish grandparents ultimately defined not by race but by adherence to a religious community. There was an irony in that also because uh, at the uh, heart of their ideology was race and Jews were treated as a race and thought of as a race but here when it came to defining them they ultimately couldn't define them in, in purely racial terms they had to go to um, adherence to a religious community in order to uh, achieve the necessary result. That definition had immediate and basic effects. Under the Nuremberg laws of September 1935, it stripped Jews of the right to citizenship. Because only people of Aryan blood could have German citizenship. And with the stripping of citizenship went things like the protections of citizenship and full political rights, like the right to vote and the right to stand for election. At the general level, it had a massive blow, it dealt a massive blow to the <coughs> communal <coughs> psyche of the Jews, of the Jewish community, because Thenceforth, they were officially, formally defined legally and defined as inferior and separate. At the personal level, it had a devastating impact. And when I teach this in the law school, I emphasize to my students that although we are in a law school, we're in an academic setting, and we're studying the Nazi era through the lens of law and the legal system, not for one single solitary moment can we ever forget the intensely personal, the intensely human dimension to all of this. And so in my teaching materials, after extracting the main legislation under each theme, I have extracts from memoirs, diaries, survivor testimony, people who lived through all of this and who can attest to the devastating, direct, immediate and personal effect that these laws had on the daily lives of Jews Divided Lives, 
the untold story of Jewish Christian women in Nazi Germany. There are poignant passages in which survivors in their 70s and 80s talk about their mothers suddenly out of the blue asking them to sit down and revealing this terrible secret in their background as a result of which their lives have been changed forever. People talk about the sudden devastating effect on their lives. Uh, there's one chapter that opens along the following lines. So and so went to bed at night a Christian and woke up the next morning a Jew. Victor Klemperer, whose diaries have been published in the last few years, was a professor of literature. Um, and he wrote this diary, which he kept on a daily basis. And it's a fascinating document, A, because it was written contemporaneously, but also because he has an uncanny ability to put his finger on a pulse or on the pulse of a mood <laughs> or a situation, to sum up a situation very pithily, sometimes in two, three or four words, in a way which packs a punch. So he talks, for instance, about what for him was a very unpleasant occasion because of his uh, being a Jew, Although he had distanced himself from the Jewish community, he had assimilated, he didn't really think of himself as a Jew. But because of the circumstances in Nazi Germany, uh, he couldn't associate with many people outside the Jewish community. And so one evening he and his wife get invited to dinner at the home of some friends, and he had completely forgotten that it was the Jewish New Year, Rosh Hashanah. And so he's sitting there at a table with it, which is the ritual meal in honor of this Jewish New Year and he's got to sit there with a skull cap on his head and he's got to uh, put up with what he calls readings from scripture and that um, all of which he had turned his back on and here he was suddenly being confronted by his Jewishness as a result of uh, these laws and the definition <laughs> in the laws and all of this led to a mad scramble to prove Aryanness, there was an industry that cropped up in phony certificates, certificates of baptism, certificates of sterilization to prove that people were no longer a threat. There are heartrending applications, pathetic applications, to various authorities to be exempted from legislative provisions by coming into certain, bringing people into. Uh, certain exceptions um, by uh, tracing lineage in such a way as to prove that they were not really Jewish at all. That's it. I'm sorry, yes. Oh, well, you gave statistics earlier about Jews in Germany in the 30s. By what definition? Then? And you're giving a very interesting story about people being classified that they would not consider themselves. No, were those the Nazi numbers? Or? No. No, they're the historian's numbers um, of people who were Jewish. Uh, the precise uh, criteria by which the historians come to those figures um, are not clear, certainly not clear to me as a mere lawyer, um, but uh, that to me is unimportant because what's important is uh, the perspective that these sorts of statistics give. Now, if it was a little bit here or there, it doesn't really matter in the overall scheme of things. If we're not talking about 1% but 2%, uh, it hardly matters. You know. That's theme number one, the theme of definition. The second theme, theme of racial purity. And this is an excellent example of how the theme and the assault which it represents make perfect <laughs> sense if you accept the underlying premises. So against the background of the Nazi ideology, if you believe that Aryan blood must be kept pure and that the Jews are the worst polluters of Aryan blood, excuse me, then it makes sense to prevent 
relationships between Jews and Aryans. And so the Nuremberg Laws prohibited marriage to Jews by Aryans. It prohibited extramarital relationships, relations between uh, Aryans and Jews. And it even extended to prohibiting Jews from employing female Aryans in their homes, like housekeepers, for instance. And the cutoff age was 45, because it was thought that beyond the age of 45, uh, Aryan women were safe in the sense that they couldn't conceive children um, born to Jewish fathers. The obvious effects were that these laws prevented marriage, marriages, they prevented relationships, they forced the dismissal of household help. In many cases, people who'd been long-standing, loyal and devoted members of the staff at home, virtually members of the family in many cases, but it also had devastating effects on existing marriages and whole family relationships. There's a fascinating case which took place in England, culminating in a decision in 1971 or 72, Meyer versus Meyer, in which um, a couple who had been married in Germany, uh, in which the <coughs> husband was Jewish, the wife was not Jewish, uh, decided that there was a mortal threat to the wife and therefore they should get divorced. And they did get divorced in Germany. And eventually they both moved to London and they both lived there until the husband died, but they didn't get remarried. And after the husband died, the wife wanted to claim a widow's pension. The problem was that at the date of his death, she was not his wife and therefore she couldn't claim a, a widow's pension legally. And so she went to court to annul the divorce. And what the court found was that the divorce had been in the nature of a contract between the husband and the wife. And under the principles of contract law, uh, a contract is vitiated, is nullified uh, by duress. And the court went through the factors, the sorts of factors that we're looking at now, um, and found that this woman really was under massive duress and uh, therefore the contract for the divorce was uh, nullified and therefore she was still his, um, his uh, wife at the date of death and therefore she was his widow and she could, could get the pension. That's going about it like that. I, I'm not at all comfortable with that decision because it, it the underlying premise is that it accepted the Nazi legal system uh, and the decision under it as valid, but that's not our theme today. In some cases, people escaped Germany, some married overseas, some got divorced, like in the Maya case, some were turned into the Gestapo, some committed suicide. There's a, a heartbreaking story about a, an actor, Joachim Gottschalk, um, who committed suicide uh, by virtue of the pressure exerted by these laws. Countless people were harassed and persecuted and ended up in gas chambers. In short, life was made a living nightmare for both adults and children. I must say that one of the most bizarre documents I've ever seen in the course of my work reflected this theme of racial purity, and that was the marriage contract between Adolf Hitler and Eva Braun. And you can picture the scene. April the 29th, 1945, in the bunker underneath the streets of Berlin, um, the world is collapsing around Hitler. His armies are long defeated. His thousand year Reich is coming to the end after 12 horrific years. He is within hours of committing suicide together with Eva Braun. And they have this bizarre marriage ceremony. Um, there's recently been publicity about um, the memoirs of Hitler's secretary who was present on that occasion, um, describing the surreal scene that took place. And in all of that, the marriage contract, and during the break or later on, I'm happy to show it to anyone who's interested, 
the marriage contract recites that both parties declare that they are of pure Aryan blood. Even at that stage, he was obsessed with racial purity. Two more themes, this time relating to the economic dimension, the economic assault on the Jews. The first of these two, which is really th theme number three in our progression, is deprivating, deprivation, I should say, of income earning capacity. This was important for a number of reasons, uh, one of which was to persuade the Jews to emigrate, put pressure on them to emigrate, getting them out of society that way. Also, ridding the society of their influence. The Nazis talked about a Jewish law, a Jewish medicine, a Jewish science, and so on. And in order to rid uh, the professions and the universities and the scientific and cultural worlds of that insidious influence, they had to get them out. And one of the ways was to deprive them, deprive them of the right to work in all of those uh, capacities. But in a very fundamental sense, which is important for our purposes today, it had a dehumanizing effect on the Jews. Because one of the indicia of a human being is that one can work, one can earn a living, one can support one's, oneself and one's family, put a roof over one's head, put bread on the table, clothing, and so on. And one can readily appreciate by all of this by thinking through the consequences of being put out of work. Anyone who has ever been unemployed or who's gone through financial difficulties can begin in a very, very small way to empathize with what was going on, with what it does to a person, both uh, physically and psychologically. The opening salvo in the legal assault on the income earning capacity of the Jews came on April the 7th, 1933, with the law for the restoration of the civil service. The Nazi genius for euphemism um, comes through here. For the restoration of the civil service, we're going to restore the civil service to its former glory. That's the <coughs> connotation. How are they going to do it? By ridding the civil service of non aryans so, for instance, the central provision of uh, quite a detailed law provided, officials of non-Aryan descent are to be retired. As simple as that. It was subject to exceptions, especially people who had fought in, uh, in the German military forces in the First World War. So, but these are exceptions. It was as bald and as harsh as that. Officials of non-Aryan descent are to be retired. And that applied not only to civil servants, as we understand that term, but also to um, academics, because the universities were all state-run. So all Jewish professors uh, were thrown out unceremoniously. And the same applied to the professions, to occupations, to businesses, and to trades. One after another. Yes? So when you say retired, was there any sort of understanding that you know, there would be pensions? Victor Klemperer's diaries actually um, trace his decline from the life of a middle class academic into poverty. heartbreaking to read. You trace it through how he, um, he and his wife have to measure the kilometers um, over which they're going to travel on their Sunday afternoon drive so as not to uh, spend too much on, on gas. Uh, how he has to keep his foot uh, steadily on the pedal in order not to um, spend too much gasoline. And then later on he complains bitterly about this never-ending diet of potatoes, again potatoes and again potatoes, and you can just imagine the expletives punctuating 
um, what he's saying about this infernal diet of potatoes to which he's been relegated. Um, and that's the way it was throughout the professions. For instance, the law relating to lawyers said, the profession of lawyer is closed to Jews, period. Now, in this case, there's a relevant exception because Jews were allowed to act for other Jews. But then, of course, the problem became that those, the Jewish clients, A, they had to lose in the courts, uh, which is not one of the themes I'm developing at the moment, but nevertheless, that was the case. Secondly, uh, they didn't have any money to pay anyway. Uh, so it wasn't as though one could still maintain a reasonable lifestyle. Doctors, licenses of Jewish physicians terminate as of September 30, 1938. As bald and as harsh as that, and so on, one means of income earning after another was systematically closed to the Jews, and all legally, all by law. So you can imagine the effects. One day, a person is a partner in a well-known law firm in downtown Berlin, earning uh, a highly respectable, comfortable income with a lifestyle commensurate with that income, with uh, a beautiful, elegant house in a fashionable suburb of Berlin, help around the house, expensive cars, private schools for the children, annual vacation, skiing in Switzerland, and so on. Suddenly, he wakes up in the morning, opens the paper, and sees, bang, the profession of lawyers is closed to Jews. What does that do? Where is the money going to come from to pay the mortgage, to put bread on the table, to, to, uh, to uh, clothe the children, to send them to school, to pay for all the other aspects of the life of a, an upper middle class lawyer? And the same was evident in all levels of the Jewish community. The books, the diaries, the memoirs, the survivor testimonies are replete with heartbreaking and tragic consequences. People becoming impoverished, I gave the example of Victor Klemperer. People battling desperately to retain their employment, coming, trying to bring themselves within exceptions and so on. People being forced to emigrate and uproot themselves, leaving behind their culture, their way of life, which had been ingrained in them. Not easy for everyone, not easy for the old. Adjustment is much more difficult for the old. Even more so for people with non-portable professions. Law is not a portable profession. Medicine is a portable profession. Dentistry. There's a fabulous book by Marion Kaplan of New York University called Between Dignity and Despair. And she chronicles the special suffering of women during the Holocaust. Hers is um, a seminal book in a whole genre, which has culminated so far, just a few weeks ago, by the publication of a major book by Nechama Tech, TEC, who's a professor of sociology at the University of Connecticut. These books focus on the special suffering of women. Now, one aspect of what Marion Kaplan says is particularly relevant to our purposes this morning. Germany in the 1930s was a patriarchal society. Papa was the head of the household, he was the head of the family. He sat at the head of the table, both literally and figuratively, and he was the mainstay around which, around whom, the family was revolved. Suddenly, the father, the husband, was out of work, couldn't earn a living. For reasons which are not relevant at the moment, it was often easier for women to continue in employment, even when men couldn't. And so suddenly, women in patriarchal families were thrust into unfamiliar roles being the breadwinner, the mainstay of the family, the psychological and emotional mainstay of the family, trying to hold it all together, with the husbands, in many cases, falling into depression. Marion Kaplan uh, <coughs> records the story of one particular husband who fell into such a depression 
that he refused to eat, saying, I have no right to eat because I can't work to earn money to put bread on the table. Another theme on the economic front, expropriation of property. So far we've looked at the income side of the assault on the Jews' economic situations, and now we're looking at the capital side, the asset side. The Nazis legislated a fiendish, diabolical, four-step process to systematically dispossess the Jews of all their assets, having already attacked them on the income side. Step one in this was forced registration. Every Jewish owner of assets had to register the assets and the values of those assets above a certain threshold. The threshold was pretty low. The result was that the Nazis developed, legally, by law, a massive inventory <coughs> of Jewish <coughs> property in Germany. They did so in remarkably quick time. In about four months, they had almost everything with the help of IBM. That's another story. Also, it should be added, with um, obedience and compliance by the Jewish community. Step two was forced sale or Aryanization, often at a fraction of the value, tiny fraction. Uh, Dr. Raoul Hilberg <coughs> of the University of Vermont is one of the doyens of Holocaust history in this country, and he has a book of documents, and there's a a uh, fascinating document called an Aryanization contract where property was Aryanized by forced sale to non-Jews. And he has the contract for sale in this particular case. And you can trace through excuse me, how the purchase price is calculated. All the assets are listed, including plant and machinery um, and uh, premises, buildings, goodwill and so on, the only item for which purchase, the purchase price is calculated is the inventory. All the other assets were ignored completely, so the purchase price of this whole build business was just the inventory, but even then, in the commentary by Dr. Hilbert, he shows how even that minimal compensation was whittled away several times until what was ultimately paid was a tiny fraction of the real value of the business. There's a fascinating story, and again, I've got it in my materials, anyone who's interested can look at it. It's one of 100,000 or more cases, but what makes it particularly interesting is that it happened to the grandfather of Billy Joel. Carl Joel, Carl Joel, Billy Joel's grandfather, was in 1938, the proprietor of the largest department store business in Nuremberg. His main competitor was a 24-year-old guy. My calculation is that Carl Joel at that time was about 57 or 58, but other uh, there are accounts that say he was younger in the late, around, uh, around 50 or so. Doesn't matter. His main competitor was 24, and the way he became his main competitor was that he <coughs> did to another Jew what he was about to do to Carl Joel. Suddenly, this 24-year-old, Joseph Neckerman, waltzes into Carl Joel's business and says, I'm going to buy your business for the equivalent of 10 cents in the dollar. Now, Carl Joel was a very astute businessman. He was uh, politically aware. This was late 1938. The Nazis had been in power for five and a half years. The writing was on the wall, had been for a long time. And Carl Joel After the war in 1945, Carl Joel tried from Long Island to get his money back. Couldn't succeed. In 1947, he goes over to Germany, engages lawyers, who issued proceedings against Neckerman to get the purchase price. And Neckerman hires excellent lawyers who managed to drag it out for another 11 years. So finally, in 1958, 
20 years after the original sale, quote unquote, um, Carl Joel got something. Um, and this was all written up in uh, excellent fashion by an investigative reporter called Steve Wick for New York Newsday. And um, I was involved in the story, and as you can see, it's a fascinating one, and it could have applied to any one of uh, 100,000 people, but it happened to be particularly interesting because it was Billy Joel. The third step in this uh, fiendish, diabolical four-step process was... You wouldn't happen to know whether the Nickerman is the same person who then started the major department? Yes, 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 thank you. Neckerman, on the backs of Carl John and someone else, became extremely prosperous, extremely well-connected. He was photographed with all sorts of luminaries, political luminaries like Willy Brandt, who became chancellor later on. He became a leading light in the German equestrian movement and in fact represented Germany at the equestrian in, uh, at equestrian in the Olympic Games. I know he was there in 1960. Sorry? <laughs> yeah. oh, and, uh, what I'm trying, what I still he was there at a number of Olympics, at least three. What I'm trying to find out is whether he represented Germany at the 1956 Olympics, which took place in Melbourne. And I'm just old enough as a little kid to remember them. I, and it's, it's something that's fascinated me. And I checked up on it, and I know he represented Germany in 1960 in Rome, right up, ironically, to 1972 in Munich, where the Israeli um, athletes were murdered. So this was Neckerman. And when he died in the 1990s, as you will be aware, his death was headline-making stuff because he was so well-connected and so prosperous and so successful. Now, there's an interesting aspect to all of this which has never really been thought through, and that is that that wealth that he built up has now been passed to the second and third generations. And several generations of Joel's have been deprived of that, but that's a separate story. Let's go on to step three. Miscellaneous acts of deprivation. Uh, there was a decree forcing the Jews to pay for repairs required as a consequence of Kristallnacht. So uh, the population went on a rampage, Jewish properties were destroyed, and then the Jews had to pay to clean it all up. It was a, a major fine imposed on the Jewish community as a whole, um, but of course it came out of the pockets of individual Jews, so it was a way of depriving Jews of, um, of assets. There was a general fine of one billion Reichsmarks levied on the Jewish community following Kristallnacht. There were limits on what Jews could take out when emigrating. There were taxes on emigration of one sort of country, including a 100% tax on new goods which were bought after 1933. These were all miscellaneous ways of depriving Jews of their assets. And the final indignity was <coughs> on the Jews by step number four. The Nazis passed a law, promulgated a law, providing that upon the death of a Jew, the Third Reich became the heir of the Jews. So anything that was left after all of that uh, passed to the government. So in that way, they confiscated Jewish assets and property. Let me take one more theme, and then we'll take a break. Exclusion from educational opportunity. And this is yet another example of a means by which the Nazis whittled away at the indicia of humanity, the indicia of a human being. Not only were Jewish professors dismissed from universities, but Jews were excluded as students. Initially, uh, there was a small quota, 1.5% of the uh, student population, in some cases 5%. Later, in 1938, they were excluded altogether. Parallel developments took place in schools below university level, forcing uh, Jewish children into all Jewish schools, and ultimately, those were closed down too. Uh, devastating impacts, tensions, within families as parents were unemployed and children were out of the education system and everyone was uh, crowded together uh, in a confined space and all the more so because 
one of the other themes which I'm not going to deal with this morning is that Jews were segregated and forced in, into particular districts. Um, so they were in strange premises to begin with and everyone was heaped together and there are uh, many, many stories about the tensions uh, that all of this exacerbated um, within families. The memoirs, the diaries are replete with heartbreaking stories about kids who were bright, alert, inquisitive, talented, had hopes and had dreams and aspirations, and suddenly the door was slammed in their face. There's one terrible story about uh, one of many, about a girl of 16 whose big choice in life was going to be whether she would study law or medicine. Uh, and she talks about um, how overnight all of her hopes and aspirations are dashed and it's something with which each of us can empathize. We've all been 16 at one stage or another. For many of us we'd like to be 16 again but we've, we've certainly all been 16. We've all had our ambitions and our hopes and our dreams and aspirations and we can empathize with these kids uh, who suddenly had the doors closed to them and were forced to get involved in uh, work which was well below their intellectual capacities and well below their ambitions. We read about um, uncomprehending children below the age of 10 in many cases suddenly being turned away from school. You can't come here anymore. You could have <coughs> yesterday, but from now you can't because you're Jewish. And as is often the case, Victor Klemperer summarizes very, very pithily there's an entry in his diary, July the 23rd, 1942, latest decree, Jewish schools will be shut down from 30th June, nor are children allowed to receive private tuition. And here comes the powerful punchline. An intellectual death sentence, enforced literacy, but in illiteracy, they will not succeed. An intellectual death sentence. to go with the economic death sentence in which they were deprived of the means of income and, and of assets, to go with the other death sentences that were um, imposed, the social death sentence under which they became pariahs and were forced into ghettos and ghetto-like areas, the civil death sentence in which the court system simply refused to recognize them the stroke of the pen, 600,000 or so Jews were rendered civilly dead, having no rights whatsoever in the German legal system. All these death, forms of death, and here was the intellectual death sentence. Let's take uh, a break now, and then we'll come back and uh, move on. Before we all break. And there's an element of circularity about it, which is relevant to our theme. The starting premise was that Jews were less than human. And the legislation and everything else surrounding it then set about treating them as such. And specifically, as we've seen, it did so by slicing away at the indicia of a human being. But that, in turn, reinforced the notion that they were inferior, that they were less than human. And that really was one of the objects of doing all of this per medium of law, because law has a certain aura about it. It gets back to a, a very brief comment I made right at the beginning about this being the ultimate oxymoron. The reason it's the ultimate oxymoron is that we associate law in our minds with certain qualities, with justice, with goodness, with decency, with morality, 
with protection of the individual against the powers of the government, putting checks on governmental authority. These are the sorts of things with which we associate law. And for that reason, law has a certain aura about it. And making something legal, therefore, confers a type of imprimatur on whatever is happening. And it's important to bear in mind that we're talking about Germany in the 1930s. We're not talking about, say, California in the year 2003. We're talking about a society which was pervaded by a militaristic ethos. There's a fascinating book by a psychiatrist by the name of Waite, W-A-I-T-E, called The Psychopathic God, Adolf Hitler. I'm told that in psychiatric circles, his, uh, a lot of his contentions are controversial, but the section that interests me isn't, I don't believe, because he talks at length about the militaristic ethos which pervaded, not only the military of course, but pervaded the home, pervaded the educational system. And people were conditioned to obey, obey what appeared to be lawful authority, obey appearing to be, what appeared to be authority. And so for instance, one gets some fascinating passages in some of the memoirs of survivors. And there's another fascinating book, before I get to the survivors, by who was the prison psychologist at Nuremberg, at the Nuremberg trials. And he had free and full, wrote this remarkable, remarkable book, which was his diary of his conversations with Goering and, and, and the others who were on trial. And he talks at one stage about visiting General Keitel at the very top of the military echelon in, in Nazi Germany. And Keitel has just come back from an interrogation and he's very frustrated and very annoyed. And Gilbert pries out of him the source of his annoyance and frustration. And he had just been asked, did you ever contemplate disobeying an order of the Fuhrer? And he said, what a, I'm paraphrasing, what an absurd question. How could anyone consider disobeying the commander-in-chief of equivalent, the Fuhrer? Ah, you Americans will never understand the Prussian mentality, not the military mentality, the Prussian mentality. He's talking about an ethos of obedience. Wade talks about how kids were brought up to hold their hands in their laps at the dinner table, to sleep on their backs with their hands over the covers. One survivor speaks about going out on Sunday afternoon for walks with her parents and her siblings and how her father would instruct the kids to walk in step and she writes left, right, left, right, left, right and you can hear her screaming out the whole country was marching in step. These are fascinating tidbits which give insight into that. And so people looked at law differently, sensed this aura about law, and so making something legal legitimized it in the public mind. And therefore, the law played an important part in the circularity, helping the surrounding population to become inured to the ever-rising level of discrimination and atrocities. And that, by the way, uh, seems to me to be the answer to the conundrum posed by that bizarre exchange between Goering and Goebbels.
Goebbels was the master propagandist, the propaganda genius of the Nazi era. He understood the power of law. He had nothing but contempt of law for law, as appears many times from his diaries. But nevertheless, he understood the effect of law on the surrounding population, inuring the population, conditioning the population. There's um, a fabulous book. I keep talking about these fabulous books because they're very exciting to me intellectually. By Lieutenant Dave Grossman, who was in the US military forces in Vietnam. And the book is called On Killing. He's a psychologist by profession. On Killing. And the theme of it is what makes it easier, what conditions make it easier for one human being to kill another human being. And he talks in particular about the need to create distance, distance between me and my target. Emotional distance, psychological distance, and there are many different ways in which one create, can create that distance. For instance, he draws on Israeli research which shows that people who are taken hostage stand a much higher chance of being killed by their captors if their captors put hoods over their faces. Because then what I see is not a human being. A human being has a face. This doesn't have a face. It helps me to see that person in something other than human terms and therefore makes it easier to kill that person. That's just one example. And so what I'm suggesting is that law has that same capacity to create emotional distance, psychological distance, whatever, by branding certain people as inferior. And again, we're talking about Germany in the 1930s. If you are working in a society where people are conditioned to obeying the law, then if you make the rising level of discrimination and atrocities legal, then it changes the nature of that in the mind of the surrounding, mind of the surrounding population. But there was another system that was relevant, another legal system. Outside of Germany, there was a legal system looking down, so to speak, on Germany. That was the international legal system, international law. And so the question is, where was international law in all of this? And in the materials, there's some fascinating diplomatic correspondence, which gives us some insight into where law was. It's on page 2. 73 of the following. And what appears there is tripartite correspondence between the U.S. Embassy in Berlin and the State Department in Washington on the one hand, and the U.S. Embassy in Berlin and the German Foreign Ministry on the other hand. And a number of points emerge from this correspondence. Number one is that the U.S. Embassy was on top of what was going on. They were following developments very, very closely. They were monitoring the stream of legislation that was coming out. Number two, they were giving a thought. They were analyzing it and working out its consequences. Number three, they were reporting all of this back to Washington. Number four, Washington was considering it. The reports were not simply pigeonholed. And Washington was giving instructions, number five. And the instructions were to protest. And number six, the US Embassy in Berlin did lodge protests. protests. But what's important for our purposes is the basis on which these protests were lodged. Here is this massive, egregious assault on a segment of the population, not because of anything that they've done, but because of what they are. And the same happens at a lesser level in, our, in relation to other segments of the population. Nowhere was the torrent of legislation directed against the Jews replicated. The basis 
is summarized on page 274. This is in relation to the law which required the registration of property. We've looked at it. In the last complete paragraph on page 274, this is the core of the US protest. The government of the United States considers that the application of measures of the nature indicated to the property of American citizens of the Jewish race would violate rights accorded American citizens, etc. The protest was based on the fact that this legislation would affect US nationals, US citizens. Not because the laws were terrible, not because there was a massive violation of human rights in the legal system that was being constructed vis-a-vis -vis the Jews, but because the US didn't like the application of the laws to their own citizens. Why? The answer lies in the nature of international law at that time. Put simply, there was no such thing as human rights. There was no legal basis for the US to protest. No legal basis for saying, these are terrible laws, they violate all notions of basic human rights, uh, and therefore we protest in the strongest possible terms. There was no legal basis for doing that. However, international law at the time did recognize a right in countries to stand up for their own citizens. And this is what the US was doing. That still leaves open the question why the US didn't protest on other grounds, non-legal grounds, moral grounds, political grounds, whatever. But that's not central to our theme. And so we have to understand why it is that in the 1930s, say when this correspondence was delivered, there was nothing in international law which allowed the United States to take up the cudgels more generally. The answer lies in the fact that international law, as the name implies, is a system of law inter-nations, among nations. That means two things. First of all, it's states, countries, that create the law historically. And secondly, it's a system of law that historically has governed the actions of countries, not the actions of individuals, in ways in which we'll explain in a moment. That means that every legal system has and recognizes certain legal persons. In the United States, an adult over the age of 18 is a legal person. A corporation is a legal person recognized by the law. There are certain people who are legal persons but of diminished capacity. Someone who is bankrupt, someone who is a minor, someone who has uh, mental problems, and so on. These are all different classes or categories of legal persons. So too does international law have legal persons today. We know that international law has certain legal, has legal, different legal persons. But historically, international law has recognized only one legal person, that was the state. The state were the only actors in international law. So again, states created the system, and it applied only to states. It didn't apply to individuals. It follows that there was no such thing as individuals having rights in international law let alone human rights. So to give you an example, there was a fascinating case in the Permanent Court of International Justice, known as the Permanent Court of International Justice was the precursor of the International Court of Justice, which was set up as part of the United Nations system following World War II. Its precursor under the League of Nations system was the Permanent Court of International Justice. It's an interesting insight that uh, in in 
reconstituting the same court in the same place, they dropped the term permanent because I guess after the League of Nations system failed dismally, they recognized that there wasn't all that much permanence uh, in international law, if in anything else. Be that as it may, it was the Mavromantis Palestine concessions case. What happened was that before the First World War, when the Ottomans ruled the territory known as Palestine, they granted certain concessions, oil and business concessions, to Mr. Mavromantis. After the First World War, that area was administered by the British government under the League of Nations mandate for Palestine, and they refused to recognize, so he had to sue. But he couldn't sue on his own accord because he was only an individual. What he had to do was to persuade his state, which was Greece, to take up the cudgels on his behalf and sue Britain in the International Court of Justice. He had no standing as an individual to do that. That was indicative of the way international law looked at individuals. Individuals were no more than a mere appendage of their state. And so he was fortunate in that case that he could persuade Greece to take up the cudgels on his behalf. Had he not been able to, he would be left completely without recourse. That was the state of international law as far as individuals were concerned. That is, uh, a graphic illustration of the point. There are many others. There was an underlying theoretical basis for this. And it was set out in a 1927 decision of the Permanent Court of International Justice known as the SS Lotus. What the court said in that case was that states are sovereign. States are equal. States are independent. No state is more independent or sovereign or equal than any other state. And therefore, no one can force a state to do anything against its will. States can only be bound by principles and laws to which they consent because they're all equal. No country can force another country to do something against its will. That was the underlying theory. So that if states did agree to a particular prohibition or particular uh, course of action, then that was binding, that became law. Otherwise, it didn't. And the way states agree to what is law is in two ways. Number one, through treaties or conventions, meaning documents which they sign. A convention means a multilateral treaty. A treaty is usually what's referred to as bilateral. And the other way is through customary international law, meaning that if enough states act in a particular way over a long enough period of time, a path is beaten out, so to speak. And that path then crystallizes into customary international law, law by custom. So in both ways, states consent to international law, and if they don't consent, there's no law that's created. There is no obligation on states because they're all independent and equal and sovereign. Underlying that, and at the heart of it, is the notion of sovereignty of states, emanating from the Peace of Westphalia, which the historians and the political philosophers usually mark as the date, 1648, when the modern notion of a nation state was born. And the idea became that every state was sovereign within its own territory, and sovereignty meant that they had absolute power within their own territory. And that meant that they could deal with individuals as they saw fit within their own territory. And when you put all of that together, there was no such thing as human rights. States were what counted. So that even in the United Nations Charter, coming after the Second World War, there is something called Article 2.7, Article 2, Paragraph 7, which says explicitly, even in the modern era, that 
the United Nations can't get involved in matters that are within the domestic jurisdiction of states. Can't get involved in the internal affairs of states. The implication is horrendous. It means that a st if taken to its extreme, a state can wipe out its population. As long as it does it within the know that that's not the case, because Article 27, as we will see, has been radically reinterpreted, particularly as a result. So that was the state of international law during the Holocaust. No such thing as human rights. No basis for protesting to the German government. And that was the underlying theoretical basis for it. So now let's move into the modern era. The first priority after the Second World War was to bring perpetrators to justice. And this was even before a formal human rights system element of a successful system. Although the details of the formal human rights system weren't adumbrated until 1948 in the Universal Declaration, with which we began, nevertheless, the system of human rights was foreshadowed in cryptic, embryonic fashion in the Charter of the United Nations, and it's in the documents. Just before the Universal Declaration. Page 288. second paragraph of the preamble. We, the peoples of the United Nations, determined to reaffirm faith in fundamental human rights, in the dignity and worth of the human person, in the equal rights of men and women of nations large and small, etc. We can see these cryptic comments. They're tantalizing, but they're not yet a system of human rights because we don't know what human rights are from that document. So that was in 1945, we have the Charter, and then around the same time we have the establishment of the Nuremberg War Crimes Trials. And even though this was before the full-blown system of human rights, as I say, it foreshadowed one of the key elements of that. Because if we think through, conceptually, we're looking at it from first principles, and we ask ourselves, ideally, what would we like to see in a perfect system of human rights? Surely one of the key elements would be bringing perpetrators to justice. If someone violates human rights, there have to be consequences, otherwise it's meaningless. There have to be messages sent to would-be Hitlers that uh, this course of conduct is unacceptable, totally beyond the pale, will not be countenanced by the international community, and there are consequences. So. The Nuremberg Trials were set up, when we talk about the Nuremberg Trials, we mean two things really. One is the major trial, the trial of major war criminals as it's called, in which 22 of the leading lights in the political system of Nazi Germany were brought, brought to trial in Nuremberg. That's the famous one. Then there were 12 lesser trials conducted by the under the auspices of the United States, but with the authority of all the um, allied victors, in which defendants were brought to trial based on categories. There was a category for lawyers called the justice case. The leading lights in the Nazi judicial system, the Nazi legal bureaucracy, the justice ministry, <coughs> people who, through the legal system, had perpetrated massive atrocities, they were brought to trial. The medical trial, <coughs> doctors who perform unspeakable experiments on living, breathing, thinking human beings, which amounted to torture of the most gruesome sort, brought to trial, led by Hitler's personal physician, Dr. Karl Brandt. There were the industrialists who had created the industrial infrastructure that enabled Nazi Germany to fight the war, and so on. Two sets of trials. The Nuremberg trials were important in two respects. First of all, they achieved 
three major goals. And when we look at these three major goals, we have to bear in mind that not everyone was happy about having trials. There were voices that wanted something very, very different. What was euphemistically called a political solution. Now we're talking about voices that were not just rogue voices out of left field somewhere. We're talking about extremely respectable voices. For instance, the British War Cabinet, presided over by none other than Sir Winston Churchill, sat in solemn session and decided that they wanted a political solution. And by political solution, they meant taking them out and shooting them. Thanks very significantly to President Truman and Justice Robert Jackson of the US Supreme Court, the other view prevailed that there had to be trials, and there were three reasons why it was important to have trials. Number one was for purposes of the historical record, it was important to bring together the massive documentation. The Nazis were fanatical about dotting the I's and crossing the T's and putting everything in writing in triplicate and quadruplicate in classic bureaucratic fashion. There's one horrible uh, exchange of correspondence in relation to Marcus Luftblas, just to give an indication of how it worked. What happened was that Marcus Luftblas was a Jew of about 73, 74, who was charged with stealing a large quantity of eggs. He was brought to trial, he was convicted and sentenced to two and a half years imprisonment. There was a small item about this case in a Berlin Daily newspaper. That newspaper came to the attention of Hitler. And the first thing we read is a letter from one government department to another, written in classic bureaucraties. I refer to the case of this and, of this, and this person, Marcus Luftglas, case number so-and-so in this and this court on this and this date, reported in this and this newspaper, copy of the report attached. The report has come to the attention of the, of the Fuhrer. The Fuhrer believes that the sentence was manifestly inadequate and that the correct sentence should have been death. And there are copies. The original goes to the recipient, the copy stays on the file, and there's a copy to this file and that file. This was one of the ways that in which they were caught ultimately because towards the end of the war, they started destroying documents en masse because they could see the writing on the wall and they had been warned from 1943 and even earlier, but certainly in November 1943, there was the Moscow Declaration in which the Allied powers said, when the war's over, we're going to bring the perpetrators of these massive atrocities to justice. They knew what was going to happen, so they started destroying documents en masse. But what they forgot was that there were copies floating about. So even if they destroyed all the files on a, in a particular department, uh, there were copies in other, sometimes unrelated departments. So there's this correspondence, and the correspondence goes backwards and forward in bland bureaucraties. And eventually, the last letter in the series starts off again 
precedence to send messages to future would-be Hitlers. This is the potential consequence that you face. A third very important object of the trials was the moral dimension. We cannot stoop to their level. Applying what the British called a political solution is not a solution at all. It's a recipe for disaster because then we are stooping to their level. We're down in the gutter with them. That's exactly what they did. We have to give everyone a fair trial, give them a chance to prove their innocence, and if they're guilty, they get their just desserts. Lord Justice Lawrence, the presiding judge in the trial of major war criminals, described that trial when he opened the proceedings as, quote, unique in the history of the jurisprudence of the world, unquote. This was the first time in international law that an international tribunal had been put together as opposed to international law crimes being tried in national jurisdictions by national courts. This was the first time there was an international tribunal put together. It had been put together by an agreement known as the London Agreement in August 1945, signed by the United States, Britain, France, and the Soviet Union. Secondly, there were some crimes with which the defendants were charged, which created new terms in international law, and the main one for our purposes was crimes against humanity. Massive atrocities, atrocities on a massive scale, including murder, of course, beginning with murder. And that, of course, was controversial, as we know, because it was argued that this is retrospective lawmaking. It is a fundamental principle of justice that you can't charge someone with a crime when his or her acts were not criminal at the time they were committed. It's a fundamental principle of justice and fairness that a person ought to be able to know in advance what the consequences of his or her actions are. And if something is lawful, it offends the sensibilities to <coughs> legislate subsequently to turn it into a crime. Uh, which, of course, was disingenuous because international law, as I've indicated, uh, works by the consent of states in the traditional historical need, method. And one of the ways of expressing that is through state practice, the practice of states, how they conduct themselves. And one of the ways in which states manifest state practice is by legislation that they pass. And if one went through the legislative systems of all civilized countries in 1939 and 1933, murder was criminal. Article 311 of the German Criminal Code was never repealed, made murder a crime. And so what they were saying essentially was, well, we're being taken by surprise. You know, we didn't know that it was unlawful to kill six million Jews. That was the way the argument was put when stripped to its bare essence. And so one of the answers that the court gave in its response was, that's nonsense. The object of the principle against retrospective legislation is that the defendant ought not to be taken by surprise. Can it really be said that these defendants were taken by surprise um, being charged with mass murder, for instance? Clearly not. And so whilst the title of the crime was new, there had never in international law been a crime known by that particular name, but nevertheless the substance of the crime uh, was old hat. And thirdly, it was unique because individuals were held accountable. They argued, in light of what we've looked at a few minutes ago, about the nature of international law being a system of law internations, that the correct defendant was Germany. Germany, the state, was responsible for all these atrocities. 
it was the obverse of the argument that uh, Germany was the le legal person, the correct legal person in international law. Just as we, as individuals, could not have standing to enforce our rights under international law, because we were a mere appendage of our state, therefore also we cannot be held accountable as individuals. It's the obverse side of the coin. To which the tribunal responded resoundingly, states do not commit criminal acts. Human beings, they said men, a bit old fashioned, but men commit criminal acts. Yeah, but if I remember correctly, German will be open censorship. That they did subsequently, yes. They paid compensation for the uh, terrible atrocities committed, and there are people still getting compensation to this day, survivors who are still alive. But uh, that's on the civil side, and in every uh, legal system, every, of the common law variety, certainly. Um, the fact that uh, someone is criminally liable doesn't alter the right of the defendants to seek uh, monetary compensation, and nor does the fact that uh, defendants can, that the uh, victims can get monetary compensation uh, in any way diminish the criminal responsibility of the perpetrators. They're two separate things. The perpetrator has perpetrated a crime, therefore some form of punishment is appropriate. The victim has suffered, and therefore some form of compensation is appropriate for that person. I mean, I don't, to be honest, I don't understand what you're saying, because I'm not uh, an expert. But I sometimes have difficult understanding what you're saying. <laughs> but, I mean, if, if German was not held responsible yes. for what happened during the war, before the war, I cannot, I cannot understand why they pay the persons. Okay, now, the, the agreement um, for compensation it it came about... It was a political decision. It was a political decision, you're right, and I was going to give you the, the basis for that. But at the same time, um, the fact that the uh, defendants individually committed the crimes does not necessarily absolve the state. Okay? The, the, okay, so it's clear at this stage. We can continue in the discussion. I'm conscious that I have to finish by 12, and then from 1 till 3 it's open season. I'm very happy to stay here after 3 as well. Individuals were held accountable. Men commit crimes, said the tribunal, not states. The, the state is an abstract entity. It's like a corporation. Corporations can commit crimes, but that doesn't absolve the individuals. They commit crimes because the law says that they can commit crimes, but it's the individuals who actually commit the crimes, and therefore they also have liability. So it's an indiv a, a state, the abstract entity known as a state, doesn't pull a trigger, didn't pull a trigger, didn't pull a lever to release a trapdoor to hang someone, didn't pour human beings who did that and they have to bear the consequences of their actions. It was a major statement. We can talk about it here, and it seems natural. It seems normal, but it was revolutionary. In 1946, 47, when the court uh, was in session. And that tri those tribunals, those new birth tribunals, were very much, in particular, former Yugoslavia and Rwanda. They were also set up as <coughs> international tribunals following the Nuremberg model, albeit that they were set up differently. Nuremberg tribunals were set up by agreement of the Allied powers. The Rwanda and Yugoslav tribunals were set up by resolutions of the Security Council of the United Nations. That precise form is not a material uh, distinction. What's important is that they were set up internationally, and as such they are direct descendants of the Nuremberg model. Another important development in international human rights law after the war was the Genocide Convention, which was opened for signature 
and adopted by the United Nations General Assembly on December the 9th, 1948, one day before the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. This is a remarkable example of a swift development of an area of international law. In 1944, the term genocide didn't exist. It was coined by a Polish emigre lawyer to this country, Dr. Raphael Lemkin, who worked in government and in academe after settling here, and who felt that there was no term in the English language that was appropriate to describe what was going on, specifically the attempt to wipe out an entire people from beginning to end. Every single Jew in, German, in Europe, over 11 million of them, was targeted for extermination. And so he coined this term genocide, and it's a hybrid of the Greek word genus, meaning a group, and side being the Latin suffix for killing, homicide, killing of a human being, infanticide, killing of a, a child, and so on. Genocide. And he promulgated this word in a book that he published in 1944, Axis Power in Central Europe. And then he lobbied for the term genocide to be accepted and for the crime of genocide to be recognized. <laughs> to the extent that two years later, in 1946, the UN General Assembly passed a resolution declaring genocide to be a crime against uh, humanity. And two years after that, in 1948, there was a full-blown convention which made genocide a crime and obligated states to prevent it and to bring perpetrators to justice. The defendants of Nuremberg were not charged with the crime of genocide because it didn't exist in 1945 when the um, tribunal was set up. Genocide really means the implementation <coughs> of the aim of killing out a group defined by uh, racial, ethnic, religious criteria. The key element in the crime of genocide is that it's not simply, if that's the right word, killing of people on a mass scale or taking other steps against them which in and of themselves would qualify as crimes against humanity, but it goes one step further, it requires the mental element, the intent to kill out a group. So that killing out Jews because they're Jews, with the intention of killing all Jews, is the crime of genocide. A modern example is found in the case of the former Yugoslavia, ethnic cleansing. One of the means by which ethnic cleansing was implemented was by rape. Because in a patriarchal society, if a woman is impregnated by a man of a different racial group, the child will follow the, um, the father's group and not the mother's. And so what you're doing is preventing births in the mother's group and um, you are therefore contributing to rendering that ethnic group, or whatever it happens to be, whatever sort of group it happens to be, extinct. So that rape can be a form of implementation of the crime of genocide. Although the defendants of Nuremberg were not charged with the crime of genocide, the reality is that today it's standard. The, tri the charter for the tribunal of the former, over the former Yugoslavia is, uh, has within it the crime of genocide, and the tribunal is given jurisdiction over that, and it's defined. So, also with the tribunal for the for Yugoslavia for 
Rwanda, I should say, the crime of genocide is also within the tribunal's jurisdiction. The International Criminal Court, which is slowly grinding into existence, um, has jurisdiction over the crime of genocide, and so on. Slobodan Milosevic is charged, among other things, with the crime of genocide. And we've had the first convictions in the last few years, as recently as 1998. There was the first conviction in history for commission of the crime of genocide in the context of the um, Rwanda Tribunal. Akayesu, A-K-A-Y-E-S-U. He was a mayor of a particular region and was convicted of uh, the crime of genocide. Beyond that, too, a broad system of human rights was established. The first step in which was the United Nations Charter, we looked at that briefly, with those cryptic comments. And ever since then, the human rights movement has developed by leaps and bounds and has gone through three broad eras, conceptual eras, not chronological eras. One is the era of general principles, where human rights are adumbrated in broad outline. The second era, conceptually, is the era of specificity, where the details are worked out. The details are very, very important because at the end of the day, however high-minded the principles are, unless you have enforceable law that can be charged against perpetrators, you end up with very little. And so it's important to have definitions so that people know what their rights are and what their obligations are, a la the principle against retrospectivity. And the third conceptual era is the era of enforcement putting teeth into the system and making sure that people who perpetrate human rights violations uh, can be held accountable and that individuals have a recourse against governments, including their own governments. Now, the era of general principles is represented by the Universal Declaration. And we started off with two salient features of that. And we can now come back to that and understand, to that document, and understand the significance of those two features. Page 290. The first line of the preamble to the Universal Declaration, whereas recognition of the inherent dignity and of the equal and inalienable rights of all members of the human family is the foundation, etc. We can understand that. That line begins to smash through the underlying assumption at the very heart of the Nazi era that not all human beings have inherent dignity and worth. That people do not have dignity and worth simply and solely by virtue of being born human beings. This says exactly the opposite. Every human being comes into the world 